Hello and welcome to part 2 of our 3 part series on Star Citizen. In part 1 we discussed the sci-fi space simulator's epic 2012 crowdfunding campaign, both on Kickstarter and creator Chris Roberts' own website, where it has now raised a world record $180 million. 2013 was a quiet year for the game, though it was originally expected to be released that year. That didn't end up happening, not by a long shot. Instead, the actual release date would be changed, moved back several times over the coming years, and would eventually be split in two. But entering 2014, things were still looking good, only not for long. By the start of 2014, Star Citizen raised a staggering $36 million through its own independent crowdfunding campaign. Chris Roberts released a blog at this milestone, as he continued to do for every million dollars raised, thanking backers and giving a few small updates. This blog mostly says the team would get back to work soon after the holiday break, and that he was going to visit his studio in Austin and Manchester. It wasn't anything big, but at least it was something. By this point, Cloud Imperium Games had completely abandoned the Kickstarter page entirely, last posting an update there in April 2013, which was nothing more than an advertisement for Shroud of the Avatar. Today, the Kickstarter comment section resembles one of the promised epic space battles within the game, defenders and attackers hurling insults at one another constantly, with mod support and PR having left long ago. Instead, updates, or at least blog posts, were posted exclusively on Roberts' own website, Robert Space Industries. There were weekly, sometimes even daily posts there about Star Citizen, but many of these were a little more than posts about lore, press clippings, and the occasional thanks for backing posts. There wouldn't be a blog post on the site with any real substance until May 2014. This update talks about one of the upcoming modules, which the game had been split into not long after its Kickstarter campaign, as a form of early access for backers. This module, Arena Commander it was called, would be delayed yet again. It marked another delay for Star Citizen, this one not being announced until the eve of its supposed launch. Backers and fans were already sitting on pins and needles waiting, as the full game was supposed to be released, at least in early access, in 2013. Now there was only a vague promise that the game would be launched sometime by the end of 2014, and that this arena module would only be late a few weeks. Well, true to their word, Arena Commander was delivered to backers in June of that year. As the name implies, this was another limited slice of the game, like the previous module, The Hangar, only this one allowed actual honest-to-goodness player versus player space battles. By all accounts, this module delivered on what a lot of Cloud Imperium had promised, high fidelity visuals, stunningly so, and brutal tactical space battles. But it was just a taste. During a presentation to the gaming press in April, Roberts detailed his plan for a full release. He planned on Arena Commander 2, which according to Polygon, would feature larger ships, the ability to fly and fight ships with larger crews, cooperative AI pilots, and in-match communications. Then would come Arena Commander 3, which would include more environments and the ability to enter a first-person shooter mode while trying to board and capture a ship. It was an incremental step-by-step -step launch that supposedly would have led to a full release of a beta version of Star Citizen that year. That was the plan, anyway. Despite these delays and vague promises by Roberts, Star Citizen's independent crowdfunding campaign continued to grow exponentially. As mentioned in the previous part, Guinness World Records recognized Star Citizen as the highest crowdfunding campaign ever in March 2014, as it raised $40 million by then. Just five months later in August, Roberts took the stage at Gamescom in Germany to announce the game surpassed the $50 million mark. That's an average of a million dollars a month, if my math is correct, which it probably isn't. And so 2014 would come to a close. The rumblings from angry backers and fans had started to grow, but for the most part, things were still proceeding swimmingly for Chris Roberts, Cloud Imperium, and Star Citizen. But then 2015 happened, and that's when the rocket engine hit the asteroid. I, I was trying to do a play on shit hit the fan, but that wasn't very succinct, was it? No. For Star Citizen, 2015 would be defined by three big milestones, and not the semi-unimportant ones that I mentioned at the end of the 2013 in my last video. No, I'm talking real, tangible disasters that befell Star Citizen this year. Before we continue, I just want to point out the Star Citizen fanbase. Let's be honest here, we all know that us gamers can get a bit 
fanatical at times. Hell hath no fury like a gamer scorned, and when talking about Star Citizen, you're bound to rile up not one, but two groups of people sitting at opposite and extreme ends of an ideological divide. Those who think Chris Roberts is space Jesus and has done nothing wrong, and will defend him and his honor against anyone who so much as looks at a logo for the game funny, and those who think Chris Roberts is space Hitler and has only ever done everything wrong and will attack him and his honor against anyone who so much as looks at a logo for the game without feeling a wealth of anger stir in their hearts. There's not much room for middle ground there, which I'm desperately trying to find in the series. That's pretty hard though, with one of the big charges against our citizen being led by Derek Smart. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, we can do without that, yep, yeah, turn it off please, yeah, turn it off. Thank you. Derek Smart was a backer of Star Citizen, and he is himself a somewhat well-known video game developer from back in the day. He's the lead designer behind games like Battlecruiser 3000 AD, Universal Combat, and Lines of Defense, to name a few. But really, he's best known for his, shall we say, brazen, take-no-prisoners personality. He vehemently defends his games and attacks his critics consistently. He sued Take-Two, publisher of Battlecruiser 3000 AD, for breach of contract, saying they released the game before it was completed. As Computer Games Online described him, over time, his reputation as an online defender of his games and unabashed pistol whipper of his enemies overshadows the games themselves. These days, he posts long, rambling screeds on his personal blog mostly against Star Citizen. Backers feeling scorned over a Kickstarter campaign is nothing new, but Smart's case is unique in that he's taken his usual zeal and has all but gone to war with Chris Roberts, Cloud Imperium Games, and the Star Citizen community. It started, as far as I can tell, on July 6, 2015, with a blog post titled Star Citizen Interstellar Citizens, in the post which starts with an update that reads more like a threat, saying, if you attack me over this, remember, I'm an old-school internet warlord. I'm no pushover, and I won't take it lightly. Your rights don't trump mine, and people don't scare me. Smart rambles on and on, talking about his legacy and the games he made and other space simulator games for some reason. Finally, when you get to what he actually has to say about Star Citizen, it's not much better. He gives a brief rundown on the crowdfunding campaign and how he doesn't have a problem with what they were pitching, before then going on to say that, in his opinion, the game they were promising, quote, will never get made, ever. He then goes on to talk about himself, again, saying he already released a similar game. I think he's trying to say he had a really ambitious idea and kept iterating on it for decades before he gave up, but it really comes across as him trying to brag with lines like these. Finally, in 2009, I gave up and released the culmination of my works as a collector's edition. To mark the 25th year anniversary of the Battlecruiser series back in August 2014, earlier this year, I updated and released the CE edition for free on Steam. Go play or read the complete docs if you're up for it. If the 97-page tutorial doesn't make your heart stop, check your pulse. You may already be dead. It remains the only game of its kind ever made, and the only all-encompassing capital ship combat game there is. You're welcome. It's really hard not to look at this as anything other than bragging or self-promotion. He tears into the media, accusing them of being too kind to Roberts and not asking tough enough questions. How he was right for thinking the first-person shooter module would get delayed, promotes another one of his own blogs, and just goes on and on rambling about disparate points. The whole thing is a mess, and while it could be great to get the perspective of another game developer, this whole blog comes off as nothing more than smug self-promotion, and that's something Smart would continue to do. He followed that blog up with another, Star Citizen Interstellar Discourse, on July 10th. It's another long, rambling, smug bit of self-promotion, including this gem of a sentence. Once my article hit and I went out and called up an army of gamers to spread it, the media had no excuse not to look into it. So they did. Then they investigated and confirmed it. Smart would continue rambling and raving and taking credit for just about everything like this for weeks, months, years. He's still starting flame wars with people on Twitter and writing blogs about Star Citizen to this day. But what really cemented Smart's legacy with this whole thing was a post on August 24th, 2015. Titled Star Citizen Interstellar Breach, Smart says he instructed his attorney to send Robert Space Industries a demand letter, demanding the company release accounting records since the start of the crowdfunding campaign, a concrete release date for the final game, and a refund option given to all backers. Less than two weeks later, Ortwin Freyermuth, I 
completely butchered that again, didn't I? The co-founder of Cloud Imperium Games and Lawyer responded to Derek Smart, saying that the letter is defamatory and without merit, rejecting all of Smart's demands. The back and forth would continue for months, years even, and it seems eventually Cloud Imperium just started ignoring Smart, which was probably for the best. The sad thing is that Smart does raise some good points every now and then. Star Citizen is taking too long. Cloud Imperium is being too secretive and vague. The media wasn't asking tough enough questions of Roberts in those first few years. But Smart has gone so far off the deep end, writing massive screeds, plastering his face on everything with slogans saying, I saw it, and even photoshopping Chris Roberts' face onto the cover of a book called Too Good To Be True. And it's just impossible to take anything he says seriously. And yet, like any loud personality on the internet, he indeed has an army. With how long Star Citizen is taking, and how vague Cloud Imperium has been over the years, and how much money it's raised, it was inevitable that people would get angry. But the real rage, the blood-boiling hatred of everything to do with Star Citizen, didn't really start until Derek Smart started beating the war drums, declaring Star Citizen an impossible task that will never happen, and that everyone should demand their money back. He even publicly called for the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in America, to get involved. The whole situation was a mess, and I believe the catalyst for such poison was an announcement made in early 2015, on February 14th. Chris Roberts announced a new studio would be formed to work on Squadron 42, the single-player portion of Star Citizen, and that this studio would be headed up by his brother, Aaron. Hey guys. Hey everyone. Foundry 42 opened in or just before February 2015 in Frankfurt, Germany, to be run by Aaron Roberts. By the way, that's another thing Smart is kind of right about. By this point, Roberts had split Cloud Imperium several times, with multiple studios in both the United States and Britain, and now this one in Germany. Trying to maintain any kind of cohesion with that many studios spread that far apart, now in countries that speak different languages, cannot be an easy task, so why did it need to be done that way? In fact, on September 22nd, 2015, Smart made a blog post saying that Cloud Imperium would be laying off several employees. Three days later, the developer told Polygon that that wasn't the case that they were merely reorganizing their studios, but that they were also eliminating some redundant positions, leaving room for interpretation. Regardless of how that does or doesn't work, it marked a turning point in development. Technically, a separate studio entirely was now developing half the game, albeit one that is still under direct control of Chris Roberts. It was an odd move, and almost exactly one year later, we found out why it happened. To get slightly ahead of ourselves here, on February 8th, 2016, Robert Space Industries posted an update titled Package Split Information, which informed backers that Star Citizen and Squadron 42 would now be two separate games, developed and sold independently of one another. This would go on to have huge repercussions in the coming months and years, but that's for our third and final part. Right now, let's finish this part by refocusing on the end of 2015. Just a month after their studio reorganization and a few months before Squadron 42 would be its own game, Roberts announced at CitizenCon 2015, which had gone from an online live stream to a full convention, that the cast of Squadron 42 would include Gary Oldman, Gillian Anderson, Andy Serkis, Mark Hamill, John Reese davis and many more. For 200 years, we have battled the Vandal. We have caught these attacks, raids, or skirmishes or incursions. But I am here to tell you that we are at war! Finally, we wrap up both 2015 and Part 2 with perhaps the biggest development so far the release of Alpha 2.0 on December 11th. Alpha 2.0 was really the first time the game showed signs of life as an actual game. You could walk around in your hangar and engage in space battles like you could in the previous two modules, but you could also do other stuff too. You could actually travel through a relatively small area in space, engage in first-person combat, 
board enemy ships and fight on them, get new ships, and a whole host of other features. It was still a long way off from delivering even half of what the team was promising, but finally they had an actual game to show, and that was a huge first step. For now, that will do for us though. 2014 and 15 were tumultuous years for Star Citizen. It raised a ton of money, but red flags were raised and flown everywhere, and another game developer would begin their own personal crusade against all things Star, Citizen, Chris, and Roberts. Join us for part 3 where I wish I could say all these elements come to a head, but seeing as how Star Citizen and Squadron 42 still aren't out yet, we're not going to be getting a definitive ending. That's not a very good sounding tease, is it? So how about instead I mention the lawsuits? Oh yes, that sounds a lot better, doesn't it?